All right, we are talking about faith tonight. Uh, you have this in your email inbox. There were some, we'd passed this out a few weeks ago, and there at least were, as of a few moments ago, some copies in the, in the box in the foyer in case you don't have them. Um, we wrapped up our discussion on grace last week. And so we've got, we'll talk about faith tonight. I, I don't anticipate us finishing this topic tonight. Next Wednesday evening is our singing night, correct? First Wednesday night of the month, right? That's when singing, right? Okay. And then the, the following one after that, I, I figure we will uh, come back here to faith. So that is kind of our game plan. So the, the handout that you have on faith dated... For, for tonight, that will carry us through the next, the next couple of weeks. So, let's begin with a word of prayer and we'll get into our study tonight. Father, we're thankful for this evening, the opportunity that we have to come together to open up your word, to study from it. We pray, Father, for wisdom as we engage with your word, that we can see the truth within it and that we can take that truth and that we can put it into our lives, that we can serve you more faithfully and bring glory to you. For our number that could not be here this evening, we pray for them that you would be with them in ways that you know are best, Father, and please open our eyes to ways that we can be of service. We're thankful for Aiden and Ryan and Rachel returning to us safely. We pray for much fruit from their efforts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so... We are talking about faith tonight, a, a very general topic here, a very general idea, and we will start to narrow down our focus as we go along here, but um, an intentionally kind of vague, kind of open-ended uh, beginning to our study tonight. So the, the, we start in this study by noting just a little bit about the, the different languages that are in use in the Bible, our New Testament's being written in Greek, the New Testament focusing a lot on faith. We're seeing these imperatives and these commands for faith in the New Testament. The Greek word that is going to translate our English word faith is generally this word right here, uh, pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. Uh, it, it is used, that word is used in a variety of ways in the Greek language, mostly to describe ideas relating to belief, persuasion, conviction. So it is a term that was in use in uh, the Greek language. This is not a term that's invented by Paul. This is one that was used uh, throughout um, the lives of Greek speakers. Uh, we often, and rightly so, often think about faith as relating to my own or your own personal faith, right? Our subjective belief in Jesus Christ and the Father and the gospel and things like that. However, uh, there is a broad use in Scripture of this term pistis, and I think it's, it's good for us to identify that. So, we've got four passages in front of us here. Matthew 25, 23, Acts 13, 34, 2 Corinthians 6, 15, and Titus 1 and verse 9. Let's, let's talk a little bit about these passages. So, you're there in Matthew chapter 25. Let's start there. Matthew 25 and verse 23. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 23. Now what, what we're looking at here, and I've, I've tried to do a little bit of this legwork for you. We're looking for, for this Greek word, pistis, in the New Testament. And so we've got four instances of it here now. This word is not going to be translated the same in all four of these passages. Okay, so that's, uh, perhaps that's eye-opening for us. That should communicate something to us. So our first one here is Matthew chapter 25 and verse 23. Okay, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 23. Uh, this is in the midst of the parable on the talents. Uh, his master said to him, verse 23, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. All right? So what is our word pistis here in Matthew 25 and verse 23? 
faithful, okay? Uh, in Nueva Biblia de las Americas, fiel. Um, so here is the word faithful. Now, what does this word mean here in Matthew 25 and verse 23? Does this passage and piece this in Matthew 25 and verse 23, does it have reference to my or your personal faith in Jesus Christ? Is the focus here on my faith, belief, submission to God the Father? What does faithful mean in this passage? Okay, it means trustworthy. It means reliable. Loyal. Obedient. obedient. Okay, so all of these all of these concepts relate to this idea. So, we're working here on getting a, a fuller concept of what this word means and how it was used throughout Scripture. So it can be the idea of loyal, of trustworthy, of obedient, things like that. All right. Our next passage, Acts chapter 13 and verse 34. Hechos capítulo 13, verso 34. Acts chapter 13 and verse 34. Alright, Acts chapter 13, starting here in verse 30, Paul preaching. God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children, in that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give to you the holy and sure blessings of David. All right, so what is our word uh, that is translating pieces here in Acts 13 and verse 34? Sure. Sure. The sure mercies of David. Nueva Biblia de las Americas Fiel. So what, what does pistis mean here in this passage? The sure mercies of David. What is this a reference to? <coughs> now this one's kind of difficult, isn't it? God's, God's will is certain. God's will is certain. So certainty. A guarantee. Guarantee. Certainty. Marginal. Guarantee. Trustworthy. Dependable. Trustworthy. Dependable. Okay? So are we seeing connection with how this word is used in Matthew 25 and verse 23? <coughs> Same kind of concepts of trustworthiness, of um, what is spoken, is carried out, loyalty. These ideas are all present here. Okay. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Segundo de Corinthians capítulo 6, verso 15. Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15. Uh, back to verse 14, verso 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness, verse 15. Or what harmony has Christ with Belial or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever. All right, so what is our word pistis here in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 15? Believer. Believer, okay, believer. Now what, what does... What does the word entail here. Having faith. Okay. The exercise of someone who has faith. Okay. Follower of Jesus. That's what, that's a, did you look at my notes? Here? I put the same thing down there. I, I said, you said Jesus follower, right? That is the context here, right? Uh, that's the context here in chapter 6 and verse 15. We are in Christ. We are with Christ. We are bound together with Christ. And so what harmony, what union has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? A believer here is just used in the sense of Jesus' follower. Okay? Which is going to bring in what concepts then related to faith? Or related to peace? peace? <coughs> Obedience. Obedience. Loyalty. Trust in here. Jesus can trust them with certainty. This person is trustworthy. Okay. Convicted. 
convicted. Convicted. Very good. Okay. Let's look at Titus chapter 1. Tito capitulo 1 verso 9. Titus chapter 1. In verse 9. So describing the character and conduct of shepherds or potential shepherds, uh, they are to, verse 9, hold fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching that he may be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. So what is our word peace is here in Titus 1 and verse 9? Faithful. Faithful, all right. What does faithful mean in this context? Consistent, steadfast, steadfast true. true, solid. It says here can be relied on. Reliable, sound. Right. That's that, in fact we're going to have that later in the verse, aren't we? Exhort in sound adoption. So the idea of, of health. Okay. So we're seeing there is a range to this word, and that, that's what I'm wanting us to identify here at the beginning. There is a range to this word. And so to come in and approach the idea of faith at just some sort of surface level and to say, well, faith is blank, and to just leave it at that is not a very well-rounded scriptural picture of this concept that is used in a variety of ways in a variety of different contexts. Like many things in the Bible, we're going to understand this word how? That's context. Context. Here's one that we didn't put in there uh, in the worksheet, but one I think is, is useful for us to look at. Galatians chapter 1. Galatas capitulo 1 verso 23. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 23. Galatians 1 and verse 23. Paul is about to get into the meat and substance of the book of Galatians. Uh, he has been doing some recounting of his biography up to this point. At the end of chapter 1, he is wrapping that up. In verse 21, it says that I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they were glorifying God because of me. What is our word in Galatians 1 and verse 23? Okay, this time it is faith. Okay? But Leslie, what's the idea here? It's a noun. It's a noun. It's the faith. This is an objective faith. Yeah. He is preaching what? His personal subjective faith? The word of God. He's preaching the word of God. He's preaching the gospel, right? Going back to Galatians 1, 8 and 9, that's what he's just talked about. I am preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, not another gospel. This is the message from Jesus Christ. He is now preaching that message that he once attempted to what? That he once attempted to stamp out by murdering and persecuting and imprisoning those uh, who were obedient to this faith. So faith here is not even referencing any sort of personal faith. It's referencing what? An object of faith. A faith, a standard to which we are called, right? Let me show you two other instances of faith in this sense. Look at Romans chapter 1. Or possible instances of, of this usage. Romans chapter 1. And I say possible, I understand there is some, um, some, some different ways to view this passage. But Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. This is either describing the nature of true personal faith, or it is telling us that the gospel, the objective standard of faith, requires what from men and women? Requires obedience, right? 
And this is how Paul is actually going to end the book of Romans as well. Look at Romans chapter 16. Romanos capitulo 16, verso 26. Romans chapter 16 and verse 26. But now is manifested... And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the command of the eternal, God has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. <clears throat> so just understand throughout the New Testament, this word can be used in an objective sense, and it can be used in a subjective sense. What do we mean by objective? I guess we should have started there, right? What do we mean by an objective sense of something? The standard, right? Uh, that in a base 10 system, 1 plus 1 equals 2 is an objective truth. Okay? It just is. Okay? What is an ex example of a subjective truth? Your take on it. My take on it. If I say Chick-fil-A is a fantastic place to celebrate an anniversary, <laughs> that is a subjective truth. Right? Not an objective truth. Okay. Uh, object of truth would be base 10 system 1 plus 1 is 2. So we've got subjective, we've got objective. Okay. So faith can be used biblically in an objective sense, like we see in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 23. It can be used in a subjective sense. O ye of little faith. Very good. Okay. So the most familiar way in which we interact with the term faith is, is used, I, I think most often, with reference to personal conviction that is directed toward God, uh, toward the Father, towards Jesus Christ, towards the Spirit. What does that mean? What does it mean to have a personal conviction toward God? Or if we phrase that just a bit differently... What does it mean to have faith in God or faith in Jesus? There is the faith to which we are called, uh, faith to which we are to be obedient, and then there is faith that you and I are to exercise. What does that look like? Holding ourselves to that standard. It could be holding ourselves to that standard, Lynn. <coughs> Um, in let's take Abraham and Noah right there in every instance of faith that we see in scripture what is what is absolutely present okay yes that's not where I wanted to go yet <laughs> you are correct sir what is doing <laughs> I, I don't even want to go. Yes, doing what? What's the first thing? What did you say? Who said it? One of you on the front row said it, and you're right. Say it louder. Belief. Was that you, Jenny? Thank you. Belief. Belief. Yes, it is something you do, Mike. Belief. That is, that is what I want us to, to, to run with here. Fundamental to the idea of faith is belief. That is correct. We have many friends in the religious world who see faith as simply what? As simply belief. Uh, but, but yet, I'm, I'm not even convinced that, that when pressed, when dealing with that in a logical sense, that that's actually where uh, many of my friends would end up. It is true that belief is fundamental to faith. Faith is not faith without belief. But my question is, is that all that faith is? Is faith simply and only belief. And this is where we need to work through some passages to get our answer. We got two guys hopping with their hands up. We're going to get to them, and then we'll get on. Lynn, yes, sir. I can't help but think about Jesus and all of his healing. And you had to believe in order for that healing to occur. Okay. All right. Could he have done it without it? I don't know. I'm sure he probably could have. That person had to believe. Well, he's going to raise a couple people from the dead. So there we go. But generally, Jesus is, it's the people who are craving his healing and who are exercising his faith are generally the ones who are going to be healed. Right. Brother Roach. But it's a belief that has trust and confidence. 
Now you're getting ahead of me, Brother Rose. Mm-hmm. And I would agree. <laughs> Noah. I, that's where I'm going. You yeah, and Todd, so I no, tell you Noah, what. Noah worked 100 yeah. years, and it had never rained before. All right. And Abraham believed God could even raise him from the dead. Okay. So he, you paid attention Sunday morning Bible class, didn't you? <laughs> that's the kind of belief yeah. we're talking about. It makes me feel good. I'm doing some good, right? Or Brother Roach knew that already, and I put him to sleep Sunday morning. <laughs> All right, so let, let's look at some New Testament passages here that are going to talk to us about faith. Now, the ones we're going to look at here, they, they are not all of them this Greek word, pistis, but they are all in this same word family, for whatever that might be worth to you. So just being fair and being above board here, understand that. So let's look. Let's look at Mark 16. Mark 16 and verse 16. What what do these passages teach us about faith? Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. (laughs) It teaches us that grammar is important, okay? Okay. Uh, this is this, this word here, believe, whoever believes, it is not pistis, it is uh, pisteo, it is related to that, that foundational Greek word. Um, and what does it mean? Well, Mark 16 and verse 16, he, he's given the great commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, verse 16. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. All right? Now, this this might, this is possibly a passage where this form of the word pistis is used only with reference to what? Belief. But in a context where it is possible that this only references belief, what is joined with it? An action. An action. Uh, and, and then that's not to say, and this is where I need to be careful, and perhaps where we all need to be careful, that's not to say that faith itself is not an action, right? It is joined with, per, perhaps a different way of saying it, it is joined with another act of obedience. I'm going to submit in this study that faith is an act of obedience, that belief by itself is an act of obedience. Uh, but then there is something alongside of that here in Mark 16, 16, and that is what? And that is baptism. Okay. And that if one lacks belief, if one lacks this faith, then what? Then they're separated from God, right? Okay. So a, a form of peace is here must be joined with action, must be joined with other action in order to be saved. And a lack of pisteo here automatically sees one separated from God. Okay, so faith seems to, in this passage, faith embraces what? If you're going to have faith, you've got to have what? Belief. Okay, you've got to have belief. Action. You've got to have action. Okay? So faith is associated with action. Okay? Faith is associated with whose action? My action. Personal action. Right? This is not... Something that is done to me, something that is done for me. This is something that I engage in of my own free will. All right? Let's check out Luke chapter 5. Lucas Capitulo's Cinco Verso Bente. Luke chapter 5 and verse 20. Now here's Jesus talking about someone's faith. Uh, This is the story of a paralyzed man who wants to be healed. Why can he not be healed? Does he think? Remember the story? He can't get to Jesus. Okay? So here is a great Bible story to use in talking to our kids about what? I'm looking for an F word. Oh, faith. Okay. That's cheating. That's what this entire class is about. Choose another one. Friend. Friendship. This is a passage that is all about having good friends. What do friends do? He's 
that can get you to Jesus. The kinds of friends you need in life are the people who are going to get you closer to Jesus. All right? So what do these friends do back in verse 19? But if he's to get to Jesus, there's too many people around. We can't get him to Jesus this way, so what are we going to do? Oh, wait, we're going to the roof. So number one, poor guy who, whose ever house this is. Because his roof gets tore up. All right? Uh, most likely it's one of these roofs that is made from mud and, and leaves and straw kind of compacted together. And so they literally will just get in there with their hands. The picture in the text is here. And they're just digging out a, a, a way to get what amounts to a bed roll or a stretcher down, lowered by ropes. So here's Jesus preaching, and all of a sudden, here comes fella down from the roof on a bed. Right? It's, it's, it's a story that has a, a comedic element to it. it. It's not a funny story, but there is certainly some sort of lightheartedness that I think we need, able, we need to be able to see here. And in verse 20, what is what happens? We get insight into the mind of Jesus and then he says something. What does Jesus say? <coughs> Some of your sins are forgiven you. And why does he say that? What was going on in his mind? He saw their faces. Oh, he saw their face. So tell me something about faith from Luke chapter 5. Faith can be seen. Faith can be seen. And so for faith to be seen, it has to be more than merely what? It has to be more than merely mental. There's got to be some sort of external component to it. Faith is seen. And by the way, whose faith was seen here? Faith of the friends. Right now, we, we don't know anything about the paralyzed man, but we do know about his friends. And it was their faith that was seen. And of course, what did they do? How was their faith seen? In, in their overwhelming trust and confidence of Jesus that they were not going to let any impediment stand between them and getting to him. And so they tear up the roof, lower the bed, and get to Jesus. So faith can be seen in this instance. It was seen in their digging through the roof and lowering their friend Jesus. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romanos capitulo 10, verso 17. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Romans chapter 10. Let's, uh, let's jump back up here. Verse 1, let's do some textual work here. Brethren, Paul says, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for them. And who is them here contextually, super Bible students? Israel, very good. National Israel. For them is their salvation, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of of God, for Christ is the end of the law uh, for righteousness to everyone who believes. All right, so Paul wants his fleshly brethren, his fellow Israelites, to be saved. That salvation is not going to come through the law of Moses. That salvation is going to come through Jesus. Jesus. Yes, very good. Thank you. Jesus is the answer this time. So, verse eight. What does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. <coughs> so he's talking about conditions for being saved here. What one must do in order to be saved. But how do we get to that point? How do we get to that point of confessing and believing? Verse 10 for with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture has said, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. All right, so all of this is springing from a heart of belief. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this offer of salvation is available to whom? To anyone, and it is upon the basis of what? The belief. Of belief. Okay? So this offer of salvation in Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all, is available to all on the basis of belief. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14. Then Paul starts to walk through this, or work through this. But how will they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And so... 
I need to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, but that calling on the name of the Lord, Paul notes, is distinct from what? Belief. From belief. Nonetheless, belief is a necessary component of calling upon the name of the Lord. All right? So perhaps in our discussions with our friends, let's just take this, this moment to make this point. Perhaps in our discussion with our religious friends, we need to be keen on making the point that we are not trying to minimize the importance of belief. But rather that we are simply trying to state that the Bible has a more well-rounded picture of what man's response is to God. It embraces belief. Belief is necessary. But belief is not the only component of man's response to God in order to receive salvation. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not believed? heard. Okay. So before we get to belief, notice Paul's argument here, before we get to belief, what precedes belief? Yeah. Gotta hear. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. However, they did not all heed the glad tidings or, does your Bible have another word there instead of glad tidings? What is it that men and women need to hear? Okay, so if we're getting to the point that we can call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, it involves belief, it involves hearing, and hearing what? Hearing the gospel. That is, not, not hearing a still small voice, not hearing a burning in the bosom, not hearing a, a direct communication from God, it's hearing what? Hearing the gospel. And then keep reading. However, they did not, this is verse 16, verse of the AC says, however, they did not all heed the glad tidings. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing. hearing. Now I notice this back in verse 14. You've got two concepts that proceed from belief. What are they? Or that proceed from hearing, rather. Believing and calling. Believing and calling. Uh, here in verse 17, he seems to combine those two concepts into one and calls it what? Faith. This faith comes by hearing. And this hearing from what? The word of God or the word of Christ. How do we call upon the name of the Lord? We, we believe. We hear. We develop faith. Faith that is based on what? Faith comes by hearing. hearing and hearing by word. So Paul, Paul is making it a very look if you're an A, B, C, D, E thinker this is right up your alley isn't it because Paul just, just walks you walks you down the road here if you want to get to this salvation that he has prayed for for his Israelite brethren in the flesh back up in chapter 10 and verse 1 it all starts by hearing what? The word. hearing the gospel because it is through the hearing of the gospel chapter 10 and verse 17 that one develops what? That one develops Faith. Me and this microphone stand. We're gonna, we're gonna have a have a moment. All right. So what does Romans 10, 17 tell us about faith? You gotta hear it. Okay. Gotta hear. Gotta hear what? It stems from the gospel. Faith comes from the gospel. Right? Uh, th this is this is Paul. In, in taking us down to a worm's eye view. If you want faith, faith that leads to salvation, faith that leads to Jesus. If you want faith, if you want 
to begin in faith, if you want to grow from little faith to more faith, from small faith to big faith, faith comes by hearing. So where do we turn if we want to grow our faith, if we want to start in the faith, if we want to increase our faith? To God's word. To God's word. To God's word. So Romans 10, 17 tells us faith grows within us from a study of God's word. Notice all of the things that we've pointed out in this text that are related and connected to faith. All of them spring forth from faith, which springs forth from <coughs> the word of God. You want to grow in faith. You want to grow closer to the Lord. You want to find this salvation and forgiveness. It all begins where? With the gospel. Which, by the way, is Paul's point in the book of Romans, right? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that's Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. All right, let's look at John chapter 12. Juan capitulo 12, verso 42. John chapter 12 and verse 42. All right, that's three passages right there we've kind of dealt with in depth. I don't want to lecture too much. Questions? Yes, Tom? Not so much a question. But it's a comment. Here we go. I, I, no, go ahead. No, I, and I'm sure you've come across this. You come across some people that want to make more emphasis on certain parts of these things that we've talked about where you can't really leave any of them out. That's the point. I, I think that's an excellent point, Todd. When I when I when I'm about to say we, I mean those of us in 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 a church of Christ. Okay? Might there be somebody on the outside who says, you I said we, you just place too much <laughs> emphasis on baptism. Might somebody say, I'm not saying they're right or wrong, might they say that? They do say that. No, they do say that, yes. Okay, Todd, what is one reason that they might say that? Going along with the comment you just made. Because what is not emphasized in their church? If, if you come from a, a religious background where baptism is something you can do if you want to, it's not necessary to salvation, it's to show your faith, it is to join a church, it's something less than necessary for salvation, and then all of a sudden you hear a church say you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. Is that going to sound and hit a little different? Is that going to maybe... Why are they talking so much about baptism? Okay. I'm not saying that's wrong. We need to preach baptism because Jesus preached baptism, the apostles preached baptism, and it is fundamentally a part of the gospel. One needs to be baptized. One must be baptized in order to be saved of their sins. Okay? So don't take anything that I'm going to say in contradiction to that. Might it be the case, though, if that's how our religious friends are hearing that, that we might need to take the time to explain some things. I'm not trying to make baptism more important than confession or repentance or belief. Because in actuality, it's not. That's one of the points there in Mark chapter 16. If you get baptized but you don't believe, what is it profiting? Nothing. Because if you don't believe, you're lost. Exactly. You just got wet. So, perhaps that's, that's something we hold off in the back of our minds as we're engaging with the religious world around us. That we're not trying to say baptism is up here on the precipice and it's more important than everything else. But what we're trying to say, as Todd pointed out, is that there is more to this entire story than maybe what some people have made it out to. And I think even our re religious friends, if we can sit down and ever have the conversation, and the conversation probably doesn't need to take place on Twitter or Facebook. It probably needs to take place face-to-face. -face. But if we ever have one of those face-to-face -face conversations where we're all keeping our cool and our sanity and we're working through some of these things logically, I remember one of my friends back in Greenbrier that I've studied through this with before. I said, you're telling me that all you got to do is believe. He said, yeah. He said, do you have to repent? He said, well, yeah. 
I said, okay. If you're telling me you've got to repent, then it's not just believe. And that took a moment. And we need to be prepared for those moments. And we need to encourage those kinds of moments. And in those discussions, if something just needs to sit for a while, let it sit. Sometimes people need to work through these things on their own and they don't need me to work through it for them. Right? You ever had to fix something in your house and you've called someone over to fix it? But then the next time you fix it yourself and you get that hands-on experience and you learn a whole lot better? Right? Sometimes you've got to get that experience with it. Sometimes that's how we learn is by working through these things ourselves. We need to be able to let those kinds of things settle with us. And they may not jump to the conclusion that we do as quickly as we do. But realize they're trying to overcome a lot. And let's be patient. Let's still do the work of teaching. And let's try to bring people to Christ. Let's just realize it doesn't always happen as quickly as it did with the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Anyway. Sometimes in those kind of conversations, what I've found is helpful is um, kind of thinking of it in terms of like academia. People understand that there's prayer for the coursework before you can get to the next portion of things. Sometimes kind of laying it out like, yes, we do speak very, very big to this, but let's say this is like graduate level course that we're talking about is baptism. There's some stuff that leads up to getting to that point, which is why we preach to that so much, because everything else is embodied within it. Sure. <clears throat> All right, so look at, look at chapter 12 and verse 42 of John very, very quickly. John records for us that nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing Jesus, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So they what, in verse 42, they believed, this is a, again a form of that word pistis, believe it's going to be the same exact word that you see in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, but what would you say about their belief here? It was what? Insufficient? Why? There, there, was, there was nothing that accompanied it. They believed, but they did not confess. We'll pick up there in John chapter 12 uh, in two weeks. Thanks for your time and your attention.
Good evening and welcome to everyone. We're glad that you could all be here. We're especially grateful for our Bible class teachers and, and their good efforts. We have a, a, quite a few on our prayer list. Uh, I was told uh, before uh, services, um, Benny Castillo's uh, co-worker, uh, her daughter, uh, her name is Amanda DeLeo, uh, she's been in ICU since Saturday. She lives in California. So let's remember Benny Castillo's uh, co-worker's daughter, um, daughter Amanda DeLeo. Also, uh, Bruce Clark is not feeling well. He's not here tonight. Uh, Tyler told me that uh, Audrey and the girls are under the weather, so they're at home. Uh, let's remember, let's continue to pray for uh, David Payne's brother, Shane Spencer, or Shane Dickens. Uh, he is improving, but, but we still need to remember him. Also, um, uh, Erica Haller's sister, Susan Flores, uh, in her recovery, let's remember to pray for her. Uh, John Salyer's uh, father, Garland, uh, continues to need our prayer in, in his recovery, still having some issues with pain. Uh, let's continue to remember our sister, Nina Moody, and Roland uh, as they're adjusting to her new situation. Uh, we are uh, very grateful that the Harrison home and the Usry home are now back to their normal number and that they're back with us. We all are uh, anticipating were, you know, it was an answer to prayer that they got there and now an answer to prayer that they got home safe. And I can't wait to hear the reports on the good work that they did. Uh, Rachel is not here tonight. Uh, I can't imagine why she would be tired or anything else uh, after, you know, two weeks uh, in Africa and then a 20 whatever hour it was flight and who knows what all they had to eat over there. So, uh, let's just remember uh, her in our prayers. Uh, the song program for next Wednesday is already in the back. Uh, David Roach put that together for us. So men, if you'll be signing up for those uh, duties. Uh, Tyler's sermons is coming Lord's Day. Uh, the morning lesson is entitled uh, The New Life from Colossians 3 verses 1 through 4. And the evening lesson is entitled, Which He Had Testified Beforehand, from 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. So Lord willing, I hope we can all be here this coming Lord's Day, hear those good lessons, and worship our Heavenly Father. For tonight, uh, Tim Raspberry is going to lead us in song. Uh, Wes Ward is going to bring the invitation, and Benny Castillo will uh, dismiss us with a prayer. Let's go ahead and begin. The song of invitation will be number 285, Zion's Call. That will be the song after the lesson. Before the lesson, let us sing 361 um, in his time. In his time, in his time, Yeah. 
would you say you're a word person or a number person? Did you like English or math? I would have to say I'm probably a little bit of both. You know, I love a good crossword puzzle, but give me a good spreadsheet any day of the week. Just ask Lilith. Or anything about sports stats. Love that too. In fact, I just recently uh, read a book called Got Your Number, which was a sports book that took the numbers 1 to 99 and made a case for who or what was the deserving for a specific number. You know, for example, the number 23, unsurprisingly, Michael Jordan, right? The number 28, though, was the number of, uh, goal, of, number of medals that Michael Phelps won in swimming. So a little bit of this and that for the book. But it's, it made me think about numbers and about how a number, just like a picture, is kind of worth a thousand words. Um, and so how it can bring a specific story or person to mind. And so the right, the, my number side of my brain is immediately going to the Bible. And I start making my little list of all the numbers in the Bible that, you know, I'm thinking about what is this and that and just for fun. And so just a few of those, there's obviously a lot of them, but you know, the number three, everybody probably immediately thinks about Jesus, three days in the tomb, Jonah, the number of days he's in the belly of the fish, 10, we got 10 plagues, we've got 10 commandments, 40, 40 days and 40 nights of rain, 300, what about that? Number of men in Gideon's army, 969. Methuselah, the oldest man listed in the Bible. Obviously, lots, to, lots more and a fun little interesting exercise for a number of people you can keep going on in your own brains. You're probably already thinking of some. One more number just for tonight, 153. Maybe that one's not quite as familiar. For some reason, for me, I don't know when, but a long time ago, I came across 153, and it's stuck with me ever since. Uh, if you'll look over at John 21, and some of you may know this and have remembered this yourselves, but if you look over at John chapter 21, after Jesus had appeared, being risen, he appeared to the disciples again. Peter and them were going out fishing in the first part of the chapter, and, and they go out and get in the boat. They catch nothing. The whole morning comes, they see Jesus standing on the shore, but they don't know it's Jesus standing on the shore. And he asks them, do they have any food? They say no. He says, well, cast your net onto the side of the, the boat. You're going to find some. And so they do. And what do you know? They draw up a multitude of fish. And that's when they start to realize, and they, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved says to Peter, oh, it's the Lord. And so now Peter, being Peter, he's, puts on his, he's in his boat and he jumps out into the water and he starts heads back toward the shore. And the other disciples there start to head back with their boat, and they drag the net with the fish. And it says in verse 9, when they come to land, they saw the fire of coals and the fish laid on the bread. And Jesus said to them, bring me some of that fish that you've just caught. And Simon Peter went up and dragged the net full of fish, 153. And there were so many that the net wasn't even broken. So 153. You know, I don't know. I really don't think there's probably any significance to that number. You know, I like to think maybe as my number brain, you know, that's written just for people like us that love numbers and somehow to, you know, think about how cool 153 is. But, uh, you know, really it's just a number for me that has stuck with me. And, it re and it's one last time, 153. It's an integral part of Jesus' last miracle that's recorded in John. It's one last miracle to reinforce who Jesus was to his disciples and us. And it ties in with the main point of John's gospel. Just look back a previous chapter in verse 20, or chapter 20, and verse 30. It says, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. 153 fish. One more miracle, one more opportunity to believe. And with that belief, as verse 31 closes, and that believing, you may have life in his name. So, maybe that help, will help you remember something about the miracles of Jesus, 153. But maybe even better than that, it'll give you some more belief in who Jesus was, who he said he was. And that if you do believe, then... As John indicates, you and I and we can have life in his name. So if you're ready tonight, tonight's a great time to obey the gospel. Won't you come?
while we stand and sing. Sure. 
let us pray. We thank the Almighty Father once again for this beautiful day you provided us. We are indeed grateful for the word that is so readily available to us. We ask your Father that you grant us peace in our hearts and our minds always, that we truly have a faith in what we say and do in thy name, and be strong believers in every action that we take towards thee. We know, Father, we fall short of thy glory in many ways, yet you forgive us. We ask your Father to forgive us for taking thee for granted for every action that we take that is negative towards thy word. We ask your Father to guide, guard, and protect us from the evil and be with those less fortunate. There are many ill in this world, Father, that are indeed in need of your dire hand and grace upon them. We pray, Father, that Whatever actions are taken with their medical staffs and those tending to them, that their decisions are sound and that their recovery will be as so that we may be able to have them back in our service here in this church. We ask your Father to be with our elderly as they struggle with their health. May we be humble enough to always seek to call them, send them a, a note, a card, to let them know that they are indeed missed. May we take time also, Father, to realize that we're only here on a very small time. May we take it serious that we never know when our, uh, our, our lives will be no longer here. May we be ready. May we be a light to those around us in good works. We ask your Father to be with us as we depart from this place. May we be ready to be a service as we are indeed in need of showing others what is the true light for those that are having difficulties right now. Once again, Father, be with us as we live that we may be able to get to our home safely. This is our prayer through the Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>